Good morning, CBCCS. Welcome to our online English worship service. I'm so glad that we can gather and worship our mighty God. And just want to uh, uh, remind you, just uh, put anything that might distract you at this time. Uh, so let's have just have a quiet moment before uh, we worship. Dear gracious Lord, our souls long for you. Our hearts thirst for you. As we meditate your faithfulness, your loving kindness, your steadfast love, your grace, and your holiness, your righteousness, our hearts are full of wonder and pleasures. For you are our wisdom, you are our truth, you are our inheritance, you are our joy, and you are our song. May you draw us near to you at this time as we bring to you honor and worth that only you deserve. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Today's call to worship comes from Psalm 16, verse 5 to 11. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel in the night. Also, my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad, and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is a fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Stay with me, let's worship. Not be. 
was my cross you bore, so I couldn't live in the freedom you died
Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for singing and praising your name today, God, as we sang that you are worthy of all praise and adoration and honor, God, and we surrender all, Lord God. As, as Heather read early from the psalmist, our, your lines have fallen for us in pleasant places, God. You've done so much for your people, for sinners, God. You came down and bared our sin to the cross and rose again, Lord, giving us new life, forgiveness, and adoption into an eternal family, God. It's all of you. And Lord, I just pray that, yes, you would constantly be our vision, that we would continue to keep our eyes on you and not in the lust and distractions of this world, which are so easy to. For God, you are life. You are joy. If real freedom comes through you. The freedom that you purchased through the cross that's the real life. That's the good life in relationship with you, loving you and being loved by you from here into eternity. And Lord, help us rejoice in this, God. You are worthy of all praise and adoration. God, bless our time today as we look at the book of John, chapter 8. God, speak to all of our hearts. May you guide my words today as we look at Scripture. We love you. In your Son's name we pray.
Would you please open your Bibles to John chapter 8 or read along in this screen? And, and as Heather mentioned, just get rid of distractions, put everything down. Let's focus on the Word together, even though we're at home. Let's worship God together through His Word. So I'll be starting in John chapter 8, starting in verse 31. John writes, So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed Him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me because my words find no place in you. I speak of what I've seen with my father, and you do what you've heard from your father. They answered him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works Abraham did. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. This is not what Abraham did. You are doing the works your father did. They said to him, we we were not born of sexual morality. We have one father, even God. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me for I came from God and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? It is because you cannot bear to hear my word. You are of your father, the devil. And your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. But because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I tell the truth, why do you not believe in me? Whoever is of God hears the words of God. The reason why you do not hear them is that you are not of God. And this is the reading of God's words. From John chapter 8, starting in verse 31. And let me get back to the beginning here. So here we are, as we'll pick up from last time, Jesus is again, he's talking to uh, the Jews at the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths in the temple area. And uh, it said last time that many of the Jews actually believed in him. But what is this kind of belief? And today we're going to see Jesus is really going to press in on them. What is real belief? It's not a superficial belief in some earthly king or or some political ruler. It's much deeper than that. And for them to truly believe, it means laying down their lives, their selfishness to trust in him. And so here Jesus is going to start off and he's going to say that you must abide in me. So the first point I want you to, if you're taking notes, write this down. Abide in the word for your freedom. If you want freedom, if you want life, you have to abide in the word. The word made flesh is Jesus in everything that he says. You have to abide. Now that word abide means remain or or continue or hold to. Abiding continually, remaining continually in the word of Jesus for your freedom. It's for your good. It's for our good. And so, as we begin here in verse 31, Jesus says to the Jews who have believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. You're truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And so those who say they believe in him, he's looking at them and saying, if you abide in my word, you you believe it, you hold to it, you obey it, you truly are my disciples, my followers, and you're saved and you belong to me forever in God's family. And you will know the truth, what real truth is. Jesus is the truth incarnate. He's there. And if you know him... He will set you free. You believe that He is the Savior of the world. He will save your soul from sin and death. He will set you free. And so He's defining what is real belief. Because many times Jews will say, yes, I believe this guy is the Messiah. But many of them are thinking purely in earthly terms. That's not their biggest problem. Freedom from Rome 
or their own land to rule. Their biggest problem is they're separated from God because He's holy and they're sinful. And they're going to die and stand before God in judgment because of their sins. One commentator says this, perseverance, that word perseverance is the mark of true faith, real disciples. Through thick and thin, if I believe in Jesus, even as Christians, we all know, we still have trials, tribulations, the cost of following Christ, the hatred of the world. Perseverance is the true mark of the Christian. We're going to abide in Christ. We're going to remain in Him. We're going to stay in Him. So perseverance is a persevering to the end. It's the mark of a true Christian. A mark of a true Christian. And Jesus is really trying to say, this is what marks a true believer. From the heart, belief in Christ, remaining, I will stay with Christ, I will follow Him. He is my Lord, He's my Master, and I will follow Him. It's not a superficial, hey, this guy's some, he's some great president or he's some great king and he'll, he'll help our nation out. That's not what saves and eternally. It's our hearts, only He can change through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so he's crying out to them, abide in my word, true belief, in him as the person. See, we should all want true faith in Christ. It's not always easy. It's not simply saying, yeah, I love Jesus. One commentator makes the point that in our church, in the people of God, we really desire and should desire real supernaturally born-again people who actually have real faith in Christ. Real faith in Christ. Not this sort of, yeah, I like to come to church because I see my friends. It's a club. I like to hang out, have a social life. Jesus makes me feel good. You know, I feel like a better person. That's, that's not true faith and salvation to God. Real faith is I'm staying and remaining. I believe everything Jesus has said for my salvation. That he alone has paid for my sins. He alone is my master. And I will abide or remain. And that is truth. And we, we meditate and focus on Christ's words. We are free. free. And, and the funny thing is, everybody universally, I mean, let's be honest, wants to do their own thing, wants to do what they want to do. In some sense, everybody wants freedom. That I can be free to live the life that I choose. It's not necessarily wrong. But everybody in our own sinfulness goes about getting freedom in the wrong way. Real freedom for our lives that really make us free to have the beautiful life of freedom only comes through Jesus. Typically, what we think of freedom is that I get to do whatever I want to do and nobody's telling me what to do. Complete control over our lives. But rather, Jesus is saying, God's saying, I created you. I created you to be under me, and to be in a relationship with me. And God defines everything that's good for us because He created us and He loves us. Being in relationship with God was God's original design. His original design was that if we want freedom, we got to come to God, but it can come through His Son. And that is, that is the truly free life. Truly free life. Free, freedom is not, I get to fulfill every lust and desire as we're going to see and tease out, that means we're going to destruction. We're headed to death. Commentator uh, Don Carson says, true freedom is not the liberty to do anything we want, but the liberty to do what we ought. And it is genuine liberty, this is genuine liberty to do what we ought, because doing what we ought will now please us. Doing what we ought is what he's saying is, I ought to follow Jesus. I ought to abide in him. I must do that. And when we do that, then we have real freedom and it actually pleases us because we're pleasing God. And that brings joy and freedom. Joy and freedom. Abiding in him, following him. Abiding, of course, what does that look like today in our, our minds? Well, we, we, we read Scripture daily in our own personal lives. We meditate on what we're reading. We apply it. 
We get together with our church. We do it together as the people of God. We're in this together, loving Scripture, trying to encourage each other to apply it. That is the life of freedom. Being subjected to Christ is actually the most freeing thing in this whole universe. But the Jews aren't really getting this. So in verse 33, they say this. They answered him, we are offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? You'll be free. Now, if we look at the rest of the passage here, they're not really saying physically, earthly, they haven't ever been enslaved. They are talking spiritually because God's chosen them as God's chosen people through Abraham. They are, they've never been enslaved spiritually because they belong to God. Because obviously, they've been enslaved all the time to Pharaoh, to uh, other Babylonians, other empires. They've been enslaved all the time. But they're, they're asking him, well, we're God's chosen people. What do you mean we'll become free? I, I thought we're, we're God's Jews. We're his chosen people. I thought we were free. Jesus is saying the most important thing, more important than being physically descended from Abraham, is that you have a sin problem and that we are all, all humanity, Jew or Gentile, is enslaved to our lust and desires. And that's all we want to do. And we have complete inability to get to God on our own. Complete inability. And so we need God to help us. And that's exactly why he sent Jesus. So that people <clears throat> could believe in him. That's exactly why they, he was sent. Jesus answers them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. So everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. Practicing, now, even as Christians, we still sin. But practicing means I have no repentance over my sins. I continue to walk in them. Even if I say I believe in God, I'm still committing sin, and I don't care, and I'm still doing them. Even as Christians, we still sin, but it's what do we do with that sin? We confess it and say, Lord, help me with this. I want to grow. I want to be like you. Jesus is saying everyone who practices, continually does sin, is a slave to sin, and sin brings death. If you continue to do it, and that's your life, you are actually a slave. It's actually your master. And many of us know that. We know some sins we don't even want to do, but we keep doing them. Like, why is that? That just shows our, our depraved heart. Apart from God, I keep doing sin. And we will die in our sin, and we will be judged by God as sinners condemned to eternal hell. We're a slave to sin and death. Slave is our, uh, sin is our taskmaster. And Jesus has come to his people first and to the whole world. He says, I will set you free. free. This is the most important problem in the world, that we cannot get to God. We're slaves. We're headed to death. We have to get back to God through Jesus, and he loves us. But we have sinned. We have done wrong and evil, all of us, against a holy God. The good news for Christians that many of us know, with us having the Holy Spirit, we can actually say no to sin. Because as Paul points out in Romans 6, we have died to our sin, the chains have been broken, and now we're alive to Christ, the Holy Spirit is abiding in us, and we can say no to our sin. It's not always easy. Sometimes we fall, but we can have more and more victory over that sin. And sometimes we need the church to help us. Actually, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a must. We've got to do this together. It's very hard to fight certain sins on our own. And God does work in our heart as individuals, but so much more when the church comes around us and helps us, it helps us fight that sin. If you're struggling with addiction to pornography, get accountability, get help, focus on Jesus. God has given us the church to help each other. If you have a problem with jealousy or anger, and you're like, man, I really want to correct this. Pray with other Christians in our church, other brothers and sisters, they will help. And of course, God helps ultimately. His Spirit gives us the power to say no to sin. But if you continue in sin and just don't have any repentance, no desire to get over it through God's help, Jesus is saying, you are not actually one of mine. You don't belong to me. Verse 35, the slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. So his analogy is, well, a slave is not the same as the son. The son gets all the rights of inheritance and all the love of the father 
a wonderful, loving father. His name goes on forever. Sort of this analogy here. The slave, the slave can be cut off and turned out of the house. It's a slave. It's not a born son or daughter. Jesus is simply saying, the slave has no part in this father's house. Because if the slave belongs to sin, and that's the father, sin is the father of the slave, they cannot go to God the Father. But if the Son, the Son, sets you free, you will be free indeed. Jesus Christ is the only one who can bring us freedom, bring us into the Father's house, adopted. Yes, we're not, we're not naturally in God's house because of our sin, but Jesus can bring us into that family by forgiving our sins through the cross. And we will be free indeed. Indeed, free from sin, free to live to God forever, to love Him and to serve Him. You will be free indeed. Nothing can take that away from the believer. Verse 37, Jesus says, I know that you are offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me because my words find no place in you. Jesus says, I know what you're saying. I know you're saying you're of Abraham. But the strange thing is you are seeking to kill me Why? Because my words find no place in you. And Jesus is starting to build the case. His words are from God. Abraham listened to God. Jesus is God. Yet they're doing the ironic thing. They're they're trying to kill Jesus. Abe had real faith in God. Abraham obeyed God. He believed in God's promise that through Abraham, through the special people, God would bless the whole earth through his seed. And actually that seed is Jesus himself who brings a blessing to the whole world. Through Abraham, God was working in this family of Jews and Abraham believed in it. And God said, you are righteous because of your belief. He was saved. And the evidence of that was his obedience. But the Jews are doing the opposite. They're they're actually trying to kill the very word of God in the flesh. Jesus is again trying to point out to them, it's not an external salvation you need like some earthly king. You need a salvation of the heart. The Old Testament prophets spoke of this. You need to be circumcised in your heart. You need a new heart. Take out the old heart, put on the new heart. That's the work of the Spirit of God. You have to trust in God and believe in Him. You need salvation from the heart through real faith and trust in God. See, Jesus is beginning to call them out. I don't care if you're an offspring of Abraham. Being a physical descendant of Abraham does not mean you're saved. It's like today, if you say, well, you know, I, uh, I'm a nice guy. I, I go to church. I belong to a church. I'm actually a member of a church. You know, I've never committed any big sins. That doesn't make you a Christian. It doesn't make you saved by God. Being even being in a church. The only thing that matters when you stand before God on judgment day is whether your sins have been forgiven because you're in the presence of holiness, of majesty, and no human being has that. In fact, we're, we're, we're all evil with sin. And the only thing that can bring us to God is through Jesus Christ who paid the penalty due us on the cross and then rose for our new life And then gives the Holy Spirit to give us that new heart to all who believe. If someone in our church or other churches claims to be a Christian but lacks that fruit of loving God, of loving the church, of showing the fruit of the Spirit, that person is probably not a believer. And you will see over time, if you believe in me, you will abide in my words The person will probably be over time antagonistic towards God's teaching and the church and other people. It'll come out over time. And that's what's happening to the Jews right now. They think they belong to God and His family, but they're actually trying to kill the very Word of God. And it shows they they have no real faith. If they did, they would believe Jesus' words. He was the fulfillment of everything in the Old Testament. Second point I want you to understand is Jesus is going to start really calling them out. Number two, who's your daddy? 
and this is really important, as we start into talking about families, who's our father, what family belong to, again, like last week we saw, what world do we belong to? Either the world from above, God's world, or the earthly sinful world. Today, we're going to talk about what family you belong to. Who's your daddy? And Jesus is going to explain here. The verse 38, I speak of what I've seen with my father, and you do what you have heard from your father. Jesus, of course, is alluding to actually God the Father. We know Jesus had a virgin birth. He had no biological father. He came from Mary and from Mary's womb, but the Holy Spirit came into Mary and produced Jesus. Of course, the Jews don't know this. And of course, he says, he's starting to condemn them and imply that they are not actually of Abraham. You're doing things that are wrong that are from your father. And so they answer him. They answer him. Verse 39, Abraham is our father. What, what, do, you, what do you mean? Like, we, Abraham is our father. We've already said that. We belong to Abraham. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works Abraham did. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. This is not what Abraham did. So Jesus is basically saying, if Abraham were standing in front of me today, he would welcome me with open arms because he believes the very words of God. He trusts in God's, and he would say, oh, Jesus is the promise, the seed that would bless the whole world. Jesus is that person because Abraham has a heart that is given to God. And, and Jesus is saying, if you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works of Abraham. You would be trusting in God and you would be welcoming me with open arms. But the fact that you're trying to kill me shows that you, you don't have the same faith of Abraham. You hate, actually hate the truth. You're not actually of God. He's been telling the Pharisees that. If you really believe the Old Testament, you would accept me. You would accept me. And, and the, you know, the Bible does say there were some Pharisees and priests who did come around. Praise the Lord. Even some leaders came around, and they did believe in Jesus. Like father, like son, right? Like many of us, for good or bad, we tend to sometimes do what our fathers did. You know, I can see things that I, especially as I get older with my family, even the way I talk, some things I say to my children, I'm like, man, that sounds like my dad. For good or bad, right? For good or bad. We tend to do things like our fathers or those who have been very influential on us in up, up, our upbringing. Jesus is basically saying the same thing. I'm from my Father in heaven, who he mimics perfectly in, many, in, in, in some sense, right? The Trinity, right? Because they are, this is God. This is God. He, Jesus is God. The Father is God. And he's doing exactly what the Father does. And, but he's saying, you're doing what your Father does. And of course, they're thinking, well, no, 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 no. We belong to Abraham. Verse 41, you're doing the works your father did. And so then they say something very interesting in verse 41. We're not born of sexual immorality. We have one father, even God. We are not born of, we were not born of sexual immorality. So what could be going on here? We're not sure, but they understand maybe there was a story going around that Jesus was actually born of sexual immorality. Uh, stories could have been spread uh, who people, close people who knew Joseph and Mary and understood that she was pregnant, hadn't had the marriage yet, uh, something happened. And so there could be this belief circulating, well, where's this guy from? Well, you know, he never really tells us, maybe because, you know, he's one of those kids, came from an illegitimate uh, birth, sexual immorality, right, outside of marriage. It's possible, it's possible that they are, they're, they're saying, wait a minute, Okay, okay, you're, you're starting to condemn us, but we're not, we're not like you. We're not from a sexually immoral father or whatever. We got one father, even God, even God. So it's possible they could be going into that. Now, they, as good Jews, they know one father, really their father is God, because God says this in the Old Testament, Exodus chapter 4, verse 22, Israel is my firstborn son. So God the Father calls the nation of Israel his firstborn son. We're God's people. Okay, forget about Abraham, Jesus. All right, all right. Okay, we're even greater than that. God himself said we are his own son. We are his own son. And Jesus says something to them. If God were your father, 
you would love me. For I came from God and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? It is because you cannot bear to hear my word. If God were your father, if you really humbly put yourself under his word, the scriptures from the Old Testament, you would recognize that I am the fulfillment of all that prophecy and that what I'm saying now is true. My teaching, my my miracles all point to the fact that I am from God. I am his Messiah, the Savior of the world to come. If God were your father, you would love me. You would welcome me with open arms. Now, we know there were Jews who did. Even his disciples were on that path. We think of some of the women like Mary Magdalene. They had, they had real faith. They did believe, but so many did not. And he, he, he indicts them in verse 43. Why? Because you cannot bear to hear my word. It's not that they're like, I'm just trying to figure this out. I'm pretty neutral on it. It's they don't want it. It's a moral problem. It's a problem of their will. They want to be their own God and not truly believe that Jesus is sent from the Father. Remember, Jesus indicts them in other places. What, what, you know, which, which, one of your, which one of the prophets that your fathers did not kill? And you're doing the same thing right now. Uh, the Jews, oh no, if we lived in the Old Testament, we would never kill the prophets. He said, no, no, you're doing it right now, first of all. And you're no different than those prophets back then. Why do you think they're even better? Because at the heart, they're selfish. Sinful people, and all of us were at one point who did not know Christ, we want to do what we want to do outside of God. We are depraved, we're self-centered, we don't want to acknowledge the Creator. I don't want to hear God's Word. Jesus already said earlier in John, when the light has come, it exposes the deeds of darkness and people run. It's not that they're like, hmm, light or dark, I have a good choice here. I don't, it's all of us without Christ, when the light comes in, we, sh- we, we, we don't want it, we We see truth and we run away from it. It exposes who we are. We don't like it. We don't want want to go to Christ until God actually breaks us down and shows us in our heart His love that He actually is real and Christ is for us. We have to humble our hearts and listen. Listen to this loving God who's come for our souls. And Jesus goes on, and and I'm sure this makes them happy. I say that sarcastically because verse 44, you are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. So he's been leading them up to this point. They keep saying, well, Abraham's our father. Well, okay, God's our father. And finally, Jesus just comes out and says, your father is the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character for he is a liar and the father of lies. But can you imagine this guy who's teaching just calls you out and says, your, your father's the devil. You're in the wrong family. Sorry. Oh, man. They're like, this guy is crazy. I'm sure they are not happy at all about what he's saying. He says, you're caring. And he, he's already been saying, you're trying to kill me. The evidence is there. The one sent by God, you're trying to kill me. That's what Satan does. And this this might refer back to, of course, go back to the Garden of Eden. Satan did not want image bearers of God to rule the world. He wanted to attack Adam and Eve. He wanted them dead. And he's a liar. Jesus says he's a liar. God said, you will surely die if you you eat of this tree, not touch it. Satan comes in and says, oh, Oh, uh, you will surely not die if you eat of this tree. You won't die. You will not die. And he's lying, and he hates the truth, and he hates life that God gives. In fact, he incited Cain. He incited Cain to kill his brother, the children of Adam and Eve. And so, what Jesus is actually saying is, "You belong to this father. You're in the wrong family. You're going against God. You hate God. You're believing a lie." Believing a lie that you belong to God, you actually don't. You're living out a lie saying that your life is what matters and not what God says. And you're just like Him. You're, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, right? They say that cliche about families. You know, you're kind of like your father. You're kind of like your mother. 
Jesus is saying, you're like your father. You're living lies, and it's a willful blindness. Many of these people probably think they're doing right, but it's a lie. It's a satanic heart, a heart that says, I'm going to do everything else except what God says. Even the Pharisees who look righteous are constructing their own righteousness, which is actually very self-centered. It's all about them. And it leads to destruction, hating God, His holiness, and bringing death and headed to where their father actually lives is hell. And let's be honest, that house is hell, and they're headed there for eternity. They're headed there to their father's house. Verse 45, but because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? Because the very fact that Jesus is telling the truth, they don't believe him because they don't like truth. Satan doesn't like truth. Our sinful hearts don't like truth. That's why you're not accepting me, because you don't like the truth. And he says, if, if, if I am speaking a lie, Jesus is almost saying here, if I am lying, then tell me what I'm doing wrong. Show me, really show me where is my sin. I mean, it, it really is a good question to them. Am I sinning? Well, you, you worked on the Sabbath. And Jesus clearly has showed them that the, the laws never said you can't help somebody on the Sabbath. Where is my sin? If I tell the truth, why do you not believe in me? They, they can't do it. They cannot do it, and they're pushing him away. Lastly, verse 47. Whoever is of God hears the words of God. The reason why you do not hear them is that you are not of God. Whoever belongs to God hears the words of God. Whoever does not cannot hear the words of God. I mean, Paul says that in Corinthians. The things of God are foolishness to the world, for they are spiritually discerned. What, what, what he's saying is, and what Jesus is saying, if you don't have the Spirit of God in you, of course you don't want God. You want your own life. This really goes back to the sovereignty of God and salvation. Unless God were to act, we would all be going astray to death. Unless God took the initiative to come to us, to open our eyes, to send His Spirit, we would all be going away. Now, God uses means. It's not just, just poof, it just happens. We just become a child of God. It comes through someone telling us the good news of Christ, and then we, we get on our knees in the posture of our heart and say, yeah, I need Jesus. I am lost. I'm headed to hell. And Jesus has come to save me, to adopt me into a brand new family, to be loved forever. This is God's design for me in the world. And I want Jesus. I want Jesus. Just a couple application points as we finish up. Jesus is really telling the crowd, because they said at first, we believe in you. And he says, wait a minute, let, let, let's, let's talk about belief. He said, disciples of Christ love his word and obediently persevere to the end. Obedience does not save us. That's clear. Jesus saves us. But the fruit of us belonging to Jesus is that we will follow him to the end. We count the cost. We pick up our cross and follow Jesus. Disciples love God's word and obediently persevere to the end. I will follow Jesus my whole life. And I will love him and serve him. And he has saved me. So the, here, here's the, the, the last point I want to leave you with today as we think about this. Examine yourself. If you get any application out of this passage, the big picture, I hope it's this. Examine yourself. If you have no desire to read and meditate on God's Word, if you don't desire to gather with His people around God's Word and pray for each other and to build each other up, if you have no desire to obey Christ and to think about how I'm using my life to glorify God, let me be honest, you're not a Christian. You're not. You can say, well, I've gone to church my whole life. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, I, I raised my hand. I, I, I said I believe in Jesus. That's good enough for me. Jesus is saying, look, the fruit of that belief then, you will have a desire to abide and remain in God's word in his people, and you will seek to obey him. But if you're like, no, I, I don't really care about going to church. I, it's a drag. I don't want to pray. I don't think about the things of God. Uh, yeah, you kind of have to force me to it. I, examine yourself. 
Are you actually in Christ? Is He your Savior and your Lord? It's a complete surrender of your life to Him. And so that's what Jesus is saying. These people said they believed, but in the end, they didn't want to surrender their hearts, their own desires, to move them over to Christ's desires. Because they want to be God. Are you like that today? And so let us submit to God. And He loves us. His ways are good and they're free. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank You for Jesus' tough words here. He's really being harsh. We can't even imagine sometimes speaking like this to call someone a son or daughter of the devil. But God, Jesus is because He's saying, look, these people who say they belong to God actually hate God. They want to kill His own son, the way of salvation. They want to live out their own selfish pursuits. Lord, convict us and help us. Say, Lord, we want to follow you no matter what. We want to persevere in this faith, continually abide in you. Lord, build up our desire and our love for you. And Lord, those who may be listening to this and say, you know, I just don't have any of those desires. I, I, I really don't, don't desire Jesus. God, help them see that they're probably not a believer, God. That it, real faith in Jesus says, I will follow you and surrender to you, and I'll grow more and more like Christ. We're not perfect, but God, you give us that desire to follow you. Help us become more and more like Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Scott, for giving us uh, God's Word and the challenges uh, for us. And as I was thinking that those Pharisees and scribes, they know Bible so well, and yet they could not recognize Jesus. And how about you today? Um, let us just use this song, uh, pray uh, that God will continue to reveal who He is to us and help us to have a humble heart to receive and pray that God will give us this faith to trust what he said. Let's come. May you uh, stand up with me and sing. Thank you. 
Let's pray. God, yes, we ask that you would give us faith. Give us faith, Lord. To trust what you say, that you're good and that you're loving, Lord. God, we always need your sustaining faith. God, thank you that you've brought that to us through your Son. And Lord, uh, for those who don't know you, give them faith today. Bring them salvation, Lord. Soften hearts, pierce through the dark. God, to open our eyes. Only you can do that. God, humble us. God, thank you for your word and that we get to praise you with our lips. God, bless us now as we go our way and realize that, God, you, you're everything to us, Lord. We love you. In your son's name we pray. Amen.